This film is the second part of a film on the Alaska Peninsula, prepared by the Division of Fish and Wildlife Protection of the Alaska Department of Public Safety. It was prepared as a new type of visual reporting, designed to better inform the Alaska Board of Fish and Game and the public of the division's programs to enforce regulations and document actual operating conditions in the remote areas of the state. So once again, we invite you to a 10-day patrol in Unit 9 to see Alaska Peninsula as a protection officer sees it from the back seat of a super cop. These are the same actual scenes you would see as an officer, plus the observations of the country and the game that you would witness if you were a client of a guide on a 10-day hunt between October the 20th and October the 30th of 1971. First, I would like to show you some of the attractions of the fall hunt offered by the Alaskan guides on the peninsula. This magnificent bull moose, along with a limit of three caribou, is almost a certainty of one hunt with a competent guide. With the game division estimates of 15 to 16,000 caribou on the peninsula, there are many record class trophy bulls to select from. The caribou on the peninsula are almost continuously available during hunting season. They are available in either wheel or float plane as they migrate northward through the cinder patches and through the swamps and the river systems. In the same crystal clear rivers the caribou are crossing, one can lose himself in the pursuit of trophy fish. Rainbow, grayling, dolly varden, arctic char, and silver salmon. The unexcelled fishing in Unit 9 is now providing more of an opportunity for guides to operate over a longer season and justifies expenditures for better facilities which are later available for fall hunts. One of the other fringe benefits of a fall hunt is the abundant waterfowl available within reasonable flying time from the various camps. As in all hunting on the peninsula, an aircraft is essential if you are to enjoy the wonderful recreation available. Without aircraft, the hunter is nothing but a speck in a gigantic landscape. The judicious use of aircraft within the framework of the game regulations promulgated by the Board of Fish and Game gives access to a country that has no highways or normal means of access. For those hunters who prefer upland game hunting, it's very seldom you can fly anywhere on the peninsula without running into a large flock of ptarmigan. After October the 1st, fair season opens again and the non-resident hunter can complete his hunt if he cares to stay an additional week and make it a three-way hunt with caribou, moose, and bear, along with the small game and waterfowl, plus the fishing he can enjoy. The most recent game division harvest showed that hunters in 1971 took 133 brown bear during the spring and fall seasons in Unit 9. This is a reduction from the 1970 year when 156 bear were harvested. Noted this fall were many young bears and sows with two or three cubs each. As bear season does not open until October the 1st, some of the guides now book their hunters for caribou and moose the last week in September and then fill out just in time for the opening of bear season. The next portion of our film deals with the department's program on the peninsula and covers the personnel involved during the fall hunt. The department's goose arrives with a load of supplies from Anchorage. The goose handles all the logistics for the Pumas Creek Station and is piloted by John Klingbeil, arriving from Anchorage with a load of ab gas. The department operates with three Super Cubs in the fall, with the 180 operating north out of Dillingham. The district officer for the King Salmon District, which handles Unit 9, is Officer Wayne Fleet. He is responsible for the major portion of Unit 9, starting at Lake Clark and running almost to Cold Bay. 
In addition, he's responsible for the enforcement of one of the major fisheries in the state, the Bristol Bay Red Salmon Run. The officer in the arriving airplane is Regional Supervisor for Region 2. He has spent many years in the King Salmon and Peninsula areas. This is Officer Stewart. He's quite familiar with the problems on the peninsula, having worked intimately with them for a number of years. One of Stewart's main concerns on the peninsula is with the new and younger officers and the safety factor with the department's flying. He spends considerable time on the peninsula ensuring that the department runs a safe and correct flying program. The next officer is the Seward District officer and he's giving instructions in landing on a cinder pad to avoid problems later. He is to stop on the line marked on the cinder patch, being required to stop from where the instructors are standing to where the crossed line is marked. This is necessary when you're checking some of the small strips where the guides and the hunters land. Next, we will look into the part of the operation that involves the guided hunts on the peninsula. First, we'll take up the standard method of moose hunting for some of the guides. The moose are scattered throughout the peninsula. First, they are surveyed from the air until a sizable bull is located, as we are doing here. The smaller bulls are passed by one day while flying, we noticed a wounded moose and an aircraft nearby. We landed on the cinder patch right behind them to see what the story was. This is typical of many of the cinder patches you find near moose. You can land within walking distance or within sight of them. guide and a non-resident hunter. They said they had wounded a moose and were waiting a few minutes before going after it. We asked if they minded if we accompanied them to photograph the trip. And they said they'd be glad to have us along. So, here's the proud hunter with his large bull moose, and they are now starting to do the usual thing. They're going to measure it and put a big game tag on it. This is a good example that the big game tags we have for the moose do not reach around the base of the antlers on the peninsula. Many of the guides guarantee over a 60 inch moose and the hunter is naturally anxious to see how the horns measure up. This guide is now proceeding to take the cape off. Other methods of transportation that are becoming more common and which some guides have are track vehicles like this brand new snow track. Getting next into the caribou part of the hunt, it might be best illustrated by landing in the mountains and explaining something of the migration of the caribou. Early in the season, the caribou are high in the mountains where they have spent a large portion of the summer in their summer range. The caribou in the foreground have just moved down off the mountain behind them. They slowly work their way down from the mountain, and the majority of them work towards the north side of the peninsula, where the elevation is anywhere from 50 to 100 feet above sea level. Though they do not seem to be going any particular direction, their general direction is towards the coast. After they leave the mountains, they get to the grasslands in the swamp area and the cinder patches at the lower elevation. The big bulls are somewhat together yet, it's easy to fly over them with the aircraft while they're in the flats, as our department aircraft is doing here to examine for big heads. 
This is standard procedure for guides for hunting caribou on the peninsula with aircraft. Although some guides do hunt them on foot or with track vehicle. They are such fast moving animals and move such great distances overnight. About the only possible way to keep up with them or to keep track of them is with an aircraft. You can fly over the top of them when they are feeding or laying and watch for a big bull. There are many to pick from on the peninsula. You can slow down a Super Cup. This is a good example of it here. With flaps on, you can fly at a low speed and see in some detail the size of the antlers. You can then land and stand and select the one you want. The hard part is to select the big bull from among the many in the herd. This is one of the larger bunches in fall migrating north. During the caribou hunt, we monitor the caribou flats almost daily with the super cubs and check kills to make sure they are legal. If you note the size of a bull in the rear, the height of their antlers is almost the height of their shoulders from the ground, which gives you an indication of the size of them. They travel many miles in swamp like this. It's something that you don't land an airplane in. If you shoot one here, you have to have hip boots, and it's very difficult packing the meat out. The area management biologist for Unit 9 estimates the caribou herd on the peninsula between 15,000 and 16,000, of which we harvest about 700 a year. Of this 700, about 300 are harvested by non-residents. Now we will demonstrate how a guide would normally operate in securing a caribou for his hunter. They anticipate the direction of the migrating herd, as we saw a few minutes ago, and land ahead. The caribou will walk up to them, as these caribou here have done with us. Next begins the problem of selecting the correct one to shoot. With many of them milling around, and if you have several hundred caribou in there, it takes a few moments to select the right one and keep your hunter calm while you tell him which one to shoot. Generally, the larger bulls, as we said before, will follow at the rear. They've become alarmed now, not because of the camera, but because they flushed up two or three flocks of ptarmigan right under their feet. While they were running around from that, they heard the camera click. Now they're excited and don't know what to make of the camera sound. At this point, you can get a good look at the caribou bulls as they approach the camera. About the time you're ready for your client to shoot the caribou, another aircraft or guide will fly over and you'll have problems. This guide is flying over, looking the caribou over, and is going to land a short distance away. And he was, in a few minutes, successful. This is one of the master guides on the peninsula, with a large caribou bull he has selected from the herd for his client from back east. The hunter is now posing, and he has already put his big game tag on prior to our arrival. Here we gave him a hand in dragging the animal out of the swamp onto a little drier spot for butchering. Compare the size of the animal to the three of them, having a very difficult time dragging the entire animal.
Next, for our benefit and the boards, this guide is going to demonstrate how he butchers an animal in order to salvage as much meat as possible. He works surprisingly fast, only taking a few minutes. To make it more convenient working on the animal, he removes the cape aways. In a few moments, he has the caribou reduced to small pieces that are easy to pack and the insides clean. Next, he removes the cape down to the back of the head and he packs the antlers and the cape out first to the aircraft, which he has left on a nearby cinder patch. Now to find his aircraft. He walks through the brush and recovers his plane. He will then return and pick up his hunter and trophy and later the meat. The next portion of the guide presentation is a visit to the camp of operated by registered guide Gary LaRose of Palmer, who gave us permission to photograph his camp and trophies and to use the footage in this film. His camp is situated about a mile from our Pumice Creek headquarters on the same cinder patch. He operates out of this camp on foot for bear and with aircraft for moose, caribou, waterfowl, and fishing. His camp is pleasant. The hunter is well cared for with a dry, warm place to eat and sleep. A generator supplies power as needed. The hunters, as evident in this shot, have all filled out with moose and caribou, and the guide is now awaiting the next hunters. He has collected some very nice caribou trophies, some with double shovels. The officer is checking them over with the guide to see that tags are attached. The moose are measured and they are very satisfactory trophies for any hunter to take home. In the background can be seen the meat rack with the caribou and the moose hanging. A closer look at that meat rack reveals quarters and hams of the caribou and moose hanging from the rack, and in sacks are portions of the animals. The fat on the rear hams is nearly two to three inches thick. As the guide is demonstrating, he's breaking off the fat portion for your benefit. The meat makes excellent eating this time of the year. This guide has a clean camp, and in the foreground, he has a large garbage pit, which is covered over occasionally. What to do with the hunter between hunts? In many guide camps, this is often a problem when they have filled out early or are waiting between hunts for the season to open for a bear. This is no problem on the peninsula because within 10 minutes flying, for example, from Mr. LaRose's camp, they have some choice waterfowl hunting for emperor geese and other different types of waterfowl that frequent that area. We will land here and check on one of Mr. LaRose's goose hunters who is passing the day while waiting for his hunt to run out. A very stiff wind blowing and the airplane only requires a few feet to land on. This gentleman is very satisfied with his hunt and has two nice emperor geese which he is showing to the officer. There are literally thousands of emperor geese in this particular bay, and many of the guides fly down between hunts and let their non-resident hunters have some wonderful waterfowl hunting. The wind is blowing exceptionally hard this day, and the aircraft takes off in just a few feet.
The final portion of our presentation here is that dealing with violation. It will show you several typical violations. The first one involves the waste of a moose. This is a rather large moose just below our camp with only the cape and the antlers salvaged. The animal has been hammed and the hams thrown aside where they have been left. There is no evidence left at the scene with the exception of the front jawbone being sawed off and the cape gone. However, on the nearest cinder strip, we find a special set of tire tracks which are different than most of the ordinary wheel tracks. We began a search for the aircraft that leaves these tire prints. Checking all the strips, and we eventually find one aircraft that matches, and securing a little more evidence in the way of our officer in King Salmon, he has recovered the jawbone turned in by the suspect in King Salmon. And in turn, we match that up with the other half of the jawbone from the kill site. When confronted with the moose kill, the guy denied it and said that he had in no way left any moose there. However, when confronted with a matching jawbone and the other evidence, he readily admitted guilt and pled guilty in court. Another minor violation is the lack of harvest tickets. This happy hunter forgot to get any type of harvest whatsoever, and his guide was taken to court where he received a fine of $25. We photograph this next scene one afternoon. This is an exceptionally large bull on the right. He was standing near a little patch of willows. The next day, or within a few hours after we photographed him, the same animal had been shot and his carcass left with just the antlers taken. The officer is checking over the scene a short time later. The horns have been removed by a saw and a bullet hole is in the neck. It's a very large caribou and in about two feet of water in this marsh area adjacent to the lake. The only evidence we had in this case was the manner in which the skull plate was removed. We will try to match that up with the antlers in King Salmon or Pilot Point. You can see from this shot how close it was to the lake, just a hundred yards or less to which they would have had to pack the meat. Later, a second animal was located near this area, and it looked like the animals we photographed had been killed that same day or the following morning. We tried to match up some of the trophies in Pilot Point, but we could not find one that was sought identically. This brings us to the end of the bull moose season on September the 30th, and the animals are getting well into the rut. The game division's latest information on Unit 9 reveals that the cow-bull ratio is 46.8 bulls to 100 cows, roughly one bull to two cows. With the estimated total moose population south of Knack Neck at approximately 6,000 animals, the management biologist at King Salmon believe the population is declining. This is possibly due to poor reproduction and the calves not surviving. Harvest figures reveal that about 330 moose have been harvested on the average for 1960 through 1970 season. The 1971 season estimated at 325 to 375 animals. We are probably all in agreement that one of the primary problems on the peninsula is to get the guides and the hunters to comply with the Alaska statute requiring the salvage of most of the edible meat of wild food animals. Secondly, the problem during the fall hunt would be the illegal use of aircraft, which becomes number one once the bear season opens. Bear season starts on October the 1st, and the first kills during the bear season generally are made off old moose kills. The first bear I checked during the season in talking to the hunter who said they had shot it off the moose that they had taken earlier, they had been unable to salvage the meat due to a bear coming to the kill before they could get the meat out. So, opening day of bear season, he collected a nice nine-foot bear.
While the bears in the picture here are unafraid of us on the ground as we approach with a camera, it's a different story when an aircraft dives at a brown bear. This large brown bear frantically tries to avoid the aircraft and gives all the symptoms of having been chased and harassed by aircraft before. As we depart the peninsula at the end of our patrol, I would like to give you a brief summary of our activities in Unit 9 this past year of 1971. From cases completed in court, the state assessed fines totaling over $10,000, and the division seized two aircraft involved in violations. A total of 16 illegal brown bears were also seized in Alaska, and one guide license was revoked. A number of cases are still pending, and investigation on those continues on information supplied from the states. Charges range from waste of wild food animals to illegal possession of a brown bear skin or taking brown bear the same day as airborne. The efforts of this division in Unit 9 and in producing this film are dedicated to enforcing the fish and game laws of the state of Alaska and all regulations of the Alaska Board of Fish and Game to the best of its ability and economic resources. <laughs>